Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I am interviewing Louise Pen uh, Pennington. Louise is Professional Development Lead at Oxford University Press. Louise, good afternoon. Hi. Um, thank you for joining me. Um, could I just get you to introduce yourself to our listeners and tell everybody what you do? I'll try and be as succinct as possible because my job is quite, <laughs> um, quite a mouthful. So, hi, I'm Louise Pennington, the Professional Development Lead uh, for Primary and Secondary at OUP, Oxford University Press. Um, and I'm involved with everything from Numicon, a primary maths resource, through mm -hmm. to secondary science. Everything to do with um, referring to research, good practice, uh, and that we kind of use that to put into planning and delivery of professional development. Now, for people that don't know, what is, what is Numicon? So Numicon is uh, the reason why I work for OUP. It's a primary maths resource which um, mm -hmm. utilises uh, quite a strong pedagogy based on Bruner's CPA, so the concrete pictorial abstract approach, but actually uses some um, really um, tactile um, manipulatives to sort of make children, you know, explore and, and unpick mathematical concepts. Um, so it's a really great resource, and I found that in, in primary teaching myself. Mm -hmm. um, used it in my own classroom and then within 18 months we had it across school so it's that like teacher research in action. It's interesting, I, my first experience of Numicon was when my son brought it home coincidentally and there he was you know where having a bit of fun but also hopefully learning maths and actually he is developing that classic he loves he's great at maths but his love for it is a bit uh, kind of hit and miss and it, that's perhaps where that kind of stereotype of I'm not good at maths um, evolves. Uh, you've got a passion for CPD as well, haven't you? How, how has that how has that uh, evolved? Um, I think it's probably evolved from my own experiences and chances and opportunities that I was afforded as a younger teacher. So mm -hmm. um, I've continued to to develop myself professionally. So I've, I've continued to study beyond my degree. But I was also, um, you know, led in my second teaching job. I was a senco and senior leader. So I led. Uh, professional mm -hmm. development in school there but I also was a lead maths teacher for local authority and so worked with and supported and um, collaborated with other teachers in other schools and that's kind of where it all started. Mm -hmm. And before the pandemic you're obviously around the country? Yeah and abroad I missed a trip to New Zealand actually last Easter which I'm still oh, no. <laughs> working with teachers and going into schools so I'm, I, hopefully I'll be able to, to get myself back there at some point. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to the uh, Numicon and CPD. Um, a question I always ask uh, people I work with is, um, describe your 16-year-old self. <laughs> what were you like um, at school? I was good at school. I, I wasn't um, a problem child. I had that perfect mix of social and um, study. So I think I balanced the two quite well. And I, mm -hmm. if I'm honest, did just, just enough work to make sure I got what I needed, which I think is is a skill um mm -hmm. but I've, I've continued to you know i do i do see the social side of education quite a lot and mm -hmm. that's why i enjoy um continuing my own learning i think and, and what happened after school um, a levels in the same school so i studied at a selective comprehensive school in Oldham. the selection part was church related um mm -hmm. and um, that was in manchester in Oldham, manchester i stayed on stream at a levels which was a really eclectic mix of subjects actually i did some humanities, some science, and English language. Um, right. And then from there, I, I obviously went to university. And, and what, what did you study at university? Uh, I did a primary a Bachelor of Education with Honours, and uh, my major was Environmental Studies, and my second subject was Foundation Math. So I was a bit worried, yeah, there, if I'm yeah. honest, about yeah. teaching mathematics to that primary age range because right. of my own experiences at school, I think. So my heart warms when. Um, people go into degree teacher at uh, that teacher training degree um you know i know it's a few years back whereas you get you kind of teach first methods now but um yeah. that, that's very reassuring so what what happened next where was your first placement where did you start teaching oh the brilliant we had we had some brilliant <clears throat> placements actually we had a special school placement and that's sparked my interest in you know additional and you know sometimes more complex needs which i came mm -hmm. back to and that was what i studied for my master's degree um, my first placement that really was in the middle of Toxteth. I don't know if you know anything about I don't know Toxteth. So that's in Liverpool and, and it was just not oh, too, yes, long, of course it is, yeah. too long after that they'd had some quite famous riots there. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that school, Ross, was that was my first step into a professional role, you know, as in not being at school myself. The children had a breakfast club and it was, you know, quite some time ago. The staff mm -hmm. were really focused on the community. They had shoes lined up. Some of the children came in without shoes on. Um, it was a, quite a tough school, but very, very well led. Um, and that opened mm -hmm. my eyes a lot, I think. And I thought if I could teach here and, and manage my first placement, I think I'll be well placed. And, and you've always taught in the northwest of England? Yes, uh, around Manchester area, uh, Rochdale, Manchester, and into Oldham, yes. Um, okay, so really, really interesting. So how did you get in? you know, you mentioned the CPD, you know, your lead maths type role. Um, yeah. How has that evolved to a point where you're now with a, a, a Oxford University Press? So um, that's back to Numicon. So I um, right. obviously had a love of Numicon, found it worked in school, and then I was really wanting to be trained as a trainer so I could train other people. Um, and eventually in, um, my role moved me into working for the special needs service. And um, I was able then to, to access um, their professional development. So I was trained mm -hmm. in how to train others for Numicon. Um, and that's where it started really. So I, I was working in my local authority. I was able to train schools in my authority. So um, for me at that point, I was a specialist teacher looking at maths difficulties. And so I would often, you know, de design a program of intervention or recommend schools would use Numicon and other things to, to support the children with, with their sticking points. And then I joined the consultancy team because um, OUP has a team of consultants. That and, and, and what year was this roughly? How? Oh, um, now you're talking, Ross. Uh, probably 2012-ish, <laughs> okay. I think. Um, and then um, I was working more and more for them. And I started to go all over the place and deliver training. And then this role, my, well, my previous role was the Numicon Professional Development Leader. So I mm -hmm. applied for that. I thought that was right up my street. And then I joined the team. So before the pandemic, what, what was a kind of a normal week or month look like for you? <laughs> I guess similar to yours, there isn't one. Um, so I'd often be in Oxford one or two days a week. So that's for me, that's a 400 mm -hmm. mile commute round trip Crikey. They sometimes okay. <laughs> take eight or nine hours depending on the m1 um so i'd often stay over one night in oxford i would be in schools the rest of the time or working at home so there wasn't a typical rhythm but i really like that actually apart from managing childcare. yeah uh, i i bet but uh, that 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 kind of joy of visiting lots of schools yeah you can't put a price on that can you i think to see um how schools work to work with teachers you know, to discuss things and to, to work with them over time, particularly that sustained professional development, which, you know, um, is, is the gold standard, really. Um, but just, yeah, to be in and out of different schools, um, to, to be on learning walks, to work with SLTs, to talk to teachers and, and kind of, you know, to mm -hmm. continue to work with them. I think it's such a crucial part of your own development. What's, what, yeah, what's your favourite part of working with schools, different schools? Variety, I think. Mm. Um, I mean, every, I've been working in so many different settings and picked up so many hints and tips myself and different styles and ways of doing things. So I think that variety, definitely, the fact that I've built a really broad network um, and connections with other people um, mm -hmm. and to see how different schools run, because, you know, they're, they're very individual, aren't they? They run so differently. They, they definitely are. Um, and if I just pop back to Numicon, you know, my, my knowledge is uh, very limited. Is it expensive? How do you implement it into your curriculum? How do you teach yeah, it day to day? That's a great question. I think it's relatively inexpensive. I suppose it depends how much you buy. Some schools, you know, buy just the shapes, the plastic shapes. Some schools will buy, you know, the other things, because our kits have so many other things in, so it has quiz and air rods and things like that. And some schools mm. will buy the teaching resources as well. And so it, it either can, can really easily integrate with any kind of resource that schools use or program that they use, or they can use Numicon as their program to deliver mathematics. Mm -hmm. So it's really flexible, which I think is a real um, positive. Um, and also through curriculum changes, the Numicon pedagogy doesn't change. Some things get mm -hmm. moved around in different year groups and that, that kind of continuity is really carefully mm -hmm. looked at. But it's quite solid in terms of, of the research and pedagogy behind it. Um, so I think for me that that shows it's done to test it. Uh, um, I've got a couple other questions. So could, could, could you tell listeners a little bit more about the research on Numicon? But, and also, can you use it in other subjects? I guess we know that maths is everywhere, but how have you seen schools use it in other aspects of school life? 
that's a really great question. I think it, particularly in the early years, it permeates quite a lot of other areas of, of development. And particularly when you're trying to use maths across the curriculum. And I mm -hmm. think that's, that's quite key. Um, I think I've, um, oh, Oxford University use it as well, I, I believe. Um, in the engineering right. department and maths department, okay. don't ask me, Ross, what they do because that's well above my <laughs> own capabilities. So, I've, and it, you know, it is used in secondary schools as well, particularly mm -hmm. special needs and maths, as you've said. Um, and it basically, it just makes those concepts visible. You will have seen if your son's brought things home, how it's, you mm -hmm. know, if he's brought the shapes home, it looks like plastic shapes. But when you put them yes. in the sequence, in the order, you can see the number system. It, it becomes visible and, and it, you know, it, it comes alive and then those little shapes are weighted, so a two mm -hmm. and a, a two and a three, where the same as the five. So that's quite useful mm -hmm. thinking about algebra later on. Um, it is useful, yeah. So I think it's it's got a variety of uses. Obviously, predominantly in mathematics, but engineering um, mm -hmm. definitely in the university. Um, I've been told. Um, and think, about the research, what what was oh, yeah, the research? research. So it started. It did start as a research project actually in Brighton and Hove. Um, it was quite. Um, a longitudinal-ish study um, with some teacher researchers and mm -hmm. um, and a, you know professor of mathematics and I think that, that Numicon was born out of that research and actually it is homegrown it's from the UK you know it was it was used across Brighton and Hove in extensively in the 80s and 90s mm -hmm. um, and so the write-up and the publication of that was what led to the Numicon shapes being Sure. So, have you got any? Uh, is there any stats on how many schools use Numicon? Um, we have our own metrics, I guess, and it okay. shows that probably eighty odd percent of schools have Numicon resources in right. school. Um, if we are honest, they don't all use it to its full potential. And mm -hmm. even just yesterday, I was on a phone call with a school who said they have loads of Numicon, but it's in the cupboards. And so they wanted oh, okay. to. They wanted some inspiration as to how to get it out and start using it. So, so give, give me two or three tips. What are the two or three tips to get it out of the cupboard? Tips. What would you recommend? Yes. So depending on where you're teaching. So for early years, basically tip it in your sand and water. Start there. Right. Um, for key stage one, definitely around number concepts and um, number bonds, which is really key. You know, schools can use that um, quite easily. But also around those numbers to twenty, their structure and how they how they're mm -hmm. built. And then for key stage two, I think people get quite surprised at how well it's used for fractions, decimals, and percentages. So I think interesting. You know, yeah. <laughs> now I want to switch to workload, which is a top passion of mine. Yes. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll move away from Numicon slowly, but um, can Numicon save people a bit of workload headache? Is there are there you know what kind of resources come with yeah. the the pack, uh, what does the Oxford University Press provide in terms of yeah. CPD to reduce that burden? Um, yes, is the answer. I think for us, when we start to look at products, um, either, you know, revisions of products or development of products, teacher workload and um, ease of use is obviously central to, to what um, publishers do. And so I think mm -hmm. for us, what we've tried to do is we've put, tried to put everything in one place. So we've made, in the last other pandemic, we've made all the teaching resources digital and so schools who have the subscription for Numicon they've got all the teaching resources there they've got the lesson planning it's all done there's long medium and short term plans there you know, curriculum coverage we've also linked it to some of the key things that schools use so other products or programs that schools often use um, we have linked Numicon to that for them so they mm -hmm. don't have to do any matching or searching around for what type of activity you can use it for. So we are continually working on that. And it's really important to me, um, having spent so long in the teaching profession, to, that it's central to, to what we believe, that you know, we have to keep that workload down. It's, it's so crucial to, you know, to mm -hmm. avoid burnout of teachers and everything else. So, yes. And, and... Go on, sorry. I was going to just uh, pick up on that. So uh, in terms of the kind of resources you provide the things that you see in schools you know you've got that kind of and plus the international work you do you've got mm. quite a good oversight in terms of the successes and challenges um what would you say are the happier schools what are they doing and 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 what would you say would be a fix for the schools that might be struggling i think that's a great question and if we're still talking about workload and i think the key thing that happy schools do is they continually ask why why are we doing this? Why do we need to do this? What's the benefit of it? And I think that sometimes 
there's a lot is done because it has always been done or because it worked previously in that way and I think I mean even just this week I've talked to a teacher who's rewriting planning because it isn't on the planning format that the school use and I was saying it's all there for you it's there it's done we've done it so yeah. isn't there a way you can just annotate it or can you just like lift it across and drop it in here? So it's like, it's sometimes it's just like, please, please don't be afraid to ask why. And yeah. have that professional conversation around the benefits well, um, of some of the processes that schools. That's an interesting one because I know a lot of primary schools do the kind of purple and green kind of tickle pen type methodology for marking. And, you know, I'm not a primary teacher, you were. So, you know, does it work? Is there any academic research to support it? Is yeah. it a workload issue? What, what are your views on that particularly? Um, I always had the wrong pen in my hand at the wrong time, the wrong colour. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a big advocate of trying to give whole class feedback and verbal feedback. I think feedback in the moment has so much more impact than after the event when people haven't quite remembered what it is they were thinking or doing or how mm -hmm. they made a mistake. So I think for me, it, you know, if we can work the room and try to give, you know, timely feedback within the lesson, then I think all that, that onerous marking doesn't, you know, mm -hmm. doesn't give us as, as much as the input that we, we you know, spend doing. And, uh, you know, in some of those unhappier schools that you visited, what's the yeah. kind of reoccurring thing that pops up? Uh, too many meetings, so before school, during right. school, after school, consistently yeah. early, yeah, consistently early meetings and consistently late meetings. Lots of procedures that people haven't questioned in terms of the impact. Um, mm -hmm. You know, lots of in-depth planning um, and reinventing of the wheel, really, I think. Is okay. The things. And then also sometimes that... Um, the way that teachers feel that they're continually being watched and judged and that, that kind of lack of professional trust. And I think sometimes that comes when schools are on a journey of rapid improvement. But actually, I mm -hmm. think that sometimes to lose professional trust uh, means that you get less out of people and they get more stressed, don't they? Yeah, no, I've, I've slowly, you know, in my own kind of studies and my interests, you know, really unpicking culture and... Uh, autonomy and I think from traveling yeah. to schools you really do start to see it um, to articulate it's the harder part I suppose yeah. um, now Oxford University Press apart from publishing materials what else does it offer teachers um, another great question so one of the things that I that attracted me to working for OUP if I'm really honest was their charitable mission they mm -hmm. um, put a lot of money back into development of resources or, or content or support for teachers that is free at the point of delivery. So mm -hmm. I think that to me is crucially important. They are not just on that treadmill of churn for, for financial gain. They spend a lot of time and effort looking at teacher stresses, teacher workload, well-being, looking at what would help for a particular issue that's arisen and we do a lot of professional development and, a, and have a lot of free resources. We work so hard in the pandemic pushing mm -hmm. out for parents as well, pushing out resources, linking mm -hmm. to the BBC, um, you know, the BBC Bite Size content. We put so much, um, we put the the parent workbook for Numicom, we just, we kind of wrote it really quickly and put it up, out online um, for free, downloadable you know, printable shapes and things to do with new mm -hmm. We tried really hard. I think that part of OUP is really important to me ethically um, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, that we're trying to support with a lot of free content. You know, we have webinars, you know, continually that are free to access for, for educators. And so, yes, yeah, so I think that side of the business, I think, is really So important. tons of stuff. Um, I have to ask, how was, how was um, the pandemic for you, uh, you know, homeschooling and those types of things? How was it? Horrific. I think for someone who's who's used to being out and about a lot, being in schools, being abroad, traveling, um, even just my you know my commute just to do that is a full day. Um, I th I've gone from that to sitting in my kitchen for fifteen months now. The office is not open, and um, they have mm -hmm. a task force working on you know the responses because obviously OUP is a global company. Our offices in China were hit quite early on. Mm -hmm. um, with the COVID and so they've had a global task force and they've worked really hard and been really good at keeping everybody informed and they've had really strict and stringent safety measures in place for their staff and also mm, for good. the customers that we work for so mm -hmm. the result is that we've all been sat at home for 15 months and 
It's been difficult, but I think you see then how strong teams are and how innovative and supportive and forward thinking we are, you know, to mm -hmm. kind of stop regroup and start to change the way we do things so quickly. Um, so and, and uh, you and I will both know that when you work outside of a kind of school setting, school leadership setting, you learn insights from, you know, the business world, I suppose, in some respects. Yes. Um, so, so kind of, you know, ha, you know, given that you've been involved with OEP for, you know, 10, 12 years, mm. what kind of it, new things have you learned that you would have benefited from as a teacher or a school leader? I think that's a really good question. I, I do say this a lot, actually. One of the things that I have really found challenging but really interesting working with OUP is having the day-to-day -day working insights of how marketing and sales and publishing works. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, to, to know that as a teacher, to to kind of understand that, that business side, I think, is, is quite important. And I think a lot of, you know, I do run a business. I run the professional development business for the UK for OUP. And I think... It has helped me develop business skills, which I think, you know, more and more now school leaders need. They do need that. The budget mm -hmm. side, the, uh, the, you know, that kind of planning and strategic work. Um, and I think that side of, of, the, of my job has brought my, you know, brought a lot of skills to me in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, broadening out what I know and understand and can do. Really interesting. Um, now, um, I've got a couple. Uh, moving away from OEUP and Numicon, um, you know, to just generally, you know, working through the pandemic. How how have your how's your work adapted? You know, I suspect lots of Zoom meetings, you know, those types of things. But give us a kind of general insight into, you know, the challenges of lockdown and homeschooling. But given that your your own children might be at school, uh, well, they are. Um, yeah. Uh, how how is your kind of week shaping out the kind of things that you're juggling the things that you do just give us a little bit insight into how, how you work yes yeah, so um i mean this week's a brilliant example we've had um meetings through the day on teams um so we had a, quite a lot of board meetings and product development meetings they happen actually really well on teams and they are really succinct and and they don't overrun and mm -hmm. actually more people can come and observe. I just think they run, actually, we're going to carry on doing those, I think, long term. The, the down over runs are great, great, <laughs> great know, success. Really, really, but then you can, they have a time to, and you can just drop in at certain times and listen to a particular part that's, that's interesting to you or part of what you're working on. Then you can drop mm. out. You don't have to, like, get up and leave the room. You just, you just leave. So there's some really good positives. Um, I think it allows us, for me personally, not to have the eight hour to nine hour round trip if I'm needed in the office for something. That's yeah. meant that my working day is much more productive for not traveling mm -hmm. around. Um, and I think for professional development, we had, when that lockdown first hit, all of our professional development was face to face in schools or in a venue. Mm -hmm. And we had to really quickly regroup and think. And myself and my consultancy team have worked incredibly hard on improving our tech and different systems of working so they've all some of them have made their own things at home that they can start they can demonstrate things with they've invested right. in, you know hue cameras and, and things like that how do you think it's gonna you know post pandemic you know my, my son keeps reminding me that the black death lasted seven years <laughs> oh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but how do you think it's going to change your work and OUP, uh, yeah. you know, you know, office based physical CPD or a really bit of a blended approach. Yeah, I think. Where, yes, where do you think that's person. going? I think for us, we have learned a lot, and actually, what we've learned is that some things work really well digitally in you know, that blended approach. We are definitely not going to stop doing digital professional development. Mm -hmm. um, it's a uh, lot of people have said to us, it's been much more accessible to them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're not having to leave school or, or have the long journeys to come somewhere or it's, you know, it's more accessible than having it using a day's inset. So we're going to keep that offer um, and we are looking into and developing blended approaches as well. And then but we are reserving face to face for where it adds value and where our customers want that, because I think, you know, you've mentioned Numicon and I have a lot. But I think for something like that, where it's so hands on and practical um, that sometimes there are things that work exceptionally well when you're in a room with, with teachers and can work nearly as well digitally with mm -hmm. you know with all the technology that's available to us so i think yes we are looking and in terms of office work we're in the process now of looking at almost like must should and could what must we be in the office for what should we be mm -hmm. in the office for but actually it's not going to fall apart if we don't 
and then what could we be in the office for but actually we can continue to work at home right nice um, so um we're still I'm, to work on that now yeah i'm just thinking you know those types of questions and thinking you know the challenges for teachers we have to be in school well exactly. i say we have to we you know it, the, the parents need to go to work so they need to send their kids to school that's mm. the challenge so we need teachers in school but it does uh, throw up lots of questions for the future of education um uh, general websites for OUP or Neocon, where can teachers go to just generally find out more? Where should they start? Yeah, I mean, there's, we have our um, Oxford Primary website and everything that is on there. But I think for me as well, there's the Oxford OWL website, which, I, you know, it's for parents and teachers. And there is a lot, the parent side is completely free. Um, mm -hmm. And there's so much information, resources, blogs on there for primary education, for maths, for English, for year group specific things, recipes, activities, you know, things to do at home. It's an absolutely brilliant website. And I think that's something that I'll definitely flag up. And the teaching side. I'm sorry, I'll the top of your head. Oxfordowl.com, I think. Okay. Well, we'll mention that. Now, um, regular listeners will know we're kind of pushing the 20 minute barrier. So I'm going to start to fire some quick <laughs> questions to you. No pause, hesitate, that Timmy Mallet type approach. Um, I'll start off easy. Um, what, what project are you working on today, tomorrow? What's on your desk? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that, actually. At the moment, I'm working on a really exciting project, which OUP has just launched a teacher consultation paper for. It's called mm -hmm. the Oxford Smart Curriculum uh, mm -hmm. for secondary schools. This project has collaboration at its heart collaboration between OUP, practicing teachers, subjects and um, experts, and it really harnesses that collective expertise. And so it's a really exciting thing to be involved in. Um, for me, that that's going to be really great. And I think it's got six key pillars at its heart, coherent curriculum pathways, high right. expectation, responsive teaching and learning. So it's really focused in on that creativity, awe and wonder. And I think anything that um, that does that for me, you know, I can absolutely get behind. Okay, good. Um, finish this sentence. If you were, if I was education secretary, I would um, invest in teacher professional development. <laughs> okay. Um, piece of advice for thinking about taking the leap into doing something like you in terms of your work. Mm. Um, read, read the research. So things like the Teacher Development Trust, the Curie Research, National College for School Leadership. There's a lot of interesting and quite conflicting research around teacher professional development in particular. Um, mm -hmm. And then I just think that plan that you know I read your blog just last night around that you know what works for professional development. So there's lots of little quick things, quick wins there around protecting mm -hmm. time, um, building a plan, explore observe mm -hmm. you know models and examples reflect on your practice so is, is that plan there and i think i'd direct them to your little summary of research there as well thank you uh, what book are you reading oh um i'm quite embarrassed to say but actually it's a brilliant book i've been reading this is book it's kind of been a, a bit of a mission i've been reading it for a long time so it's called why we sleep by matthew walker i don't know if you've read that no i don't know um, that one but it's a book which is blend it's um it's a blend of kind of science and um cognitive stuff and sleep um science but it was recommended to me by a 90-year-old doctor on a train to london he waved it at me and said everybody in our generation needs to read it Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's everything from behavioural insights, the animal world, scientific research on the brain, advice and warnings about how we should respect our circadian rhythm. So it's a brilliant book, actually. Okay, that's really interesting. Yeah, cause I'm, I'm reading a lot on memory at the moment. Uh, now, I know you're a northerner. Are you a chips and gravy girl or a chips and beans or peas? What, what goes on top of your chips? <laughs> pudding. If you follow me on Twitter, rag, I'll ask us, rag 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 <laughs> right, that's a that's proper northern. Okay, uh, next question: Are you a hunter or a gatherer? I'm a hunter. Okay, uh, great. Um, next thing I would like to ask is: If you weren't doing your dream job, what would you be doing? What's that abstract, crazy thing? Um, I wanted to be and lined myself up to be a forensic scientist. Oh, okay, uh, interesting. I even dropped, I dropped languages to, to focus on science as a GCSE and then found out that having asthma um, would stop me from pursuing that to its full extent. So teaching was my second choice. Okay, interesting. Now, uh, for listeners, um, Louise has jumped out of a plane. So, Louise, what's your top tip for doing your first skydive? <laughs> Don't do it. No, actually, it was brilliant. I think for me, um, trust. Trust that everything will work and don't and definitely keep your hands folded in front of you because the urge to kind of cling on as that as you're pushed <laughs> out is uh, is sometimes overwhelming. 
Okay. Um, were you a better environmental science or a maths teacher? What were you better at in the classroom? At, at maths, actually, strangely. Okay. Advice for your 16-year-old self? Keep going. Okay. Because <laughs> you mentioned that just enough earlier. Um, biggest, uh, what are you most proud of in your career, not in your personal life? Um, I think my continual personal development so my continual <clears throat> study i think through throughout the responsibilities that adult life brings you i've still kept learning mm -hmm. and developing whether it's reading or, or a formal qualification so i think i'm most proud of that um for myself and and that is a personal and professional achievement i think so okay you, great lovely uh, if we had 24 hours together in liverpool what would you do where would we go what would we see what would we eat Oh, everything. It's such an eclectic city. The docks, the cavern, and um, some of the music scenes and street food, and of course shopping. And there's some great bars as well, Ross. I'll tell oh, well, you we, can, we can skip the shopping. <laughs> we'll just go for some food and some drinks. There you go. Um, who do you recommend I interview next and why? Oh, great question. I'd be keen to champion other women. Um, and I can think of a whole host of brilliant women, but I think for me, Cristala Jamil, she's an inspirational executive head teacher working in Tottenham National. Yeah, I know Cristala. Okay, well, there you go. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So yeah. I'll come for Cristala. <laughs> I shall reach out straight away. Um, <laughs> so where can listeners find out more about you? Your blogs or tweets, um, things like that? Yeah, so Oxford Primary, as I mentioned, Oxford Secondary, some of the things we talked about. We have Facebook page as well, but um, Twitter for me, um, at PD Louise P. Anything to do with gin, food, occasional tweets about education. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, um, since I've moved to Yorkshire, Louise, I've got really into nature. And surprisingly, this is, might be uh, surprised to discover I'm really getting into my flowers. So I've got a random question that I'm adding into my podcast. If you were a flower, what, what variety would you like to be? I would love to be an agapanthus. Right, well, I need to go and check out what that is because I, I, sus I suspect I've seen it. Um, well, I just need to make the reference to the net is that knowledge, develop, that, not that picture and the, the, it's the name. The so, uh, approach, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah, I love the campus. <laughs> I just planted some more in my garden yesterday, actually. All right, very nice. Well, I'll check it out and I might plant some of my own. Um, f final question um, What would you hope to be your legacy? Uh, oh, um, teaching. I think teaching is my legacy. So to have hopefully mm -hmm. contributed to a fairer, more tolerant and inclusive world where everyone is valued equally and has equal opportunity. And if I can instill that in my own children so they continue on that journey of, of inclusion and that to be the societal norm, I think that would be the best kind of legacy. Fantastic. Um, so, Lise, thank you. Um, second time lucky at the beginning, uh, you know, for people listening, I didn't press the record button, but we got through it. Um, and it's been nice to connect with you properly since I've moved up your way. And I hope we can meet. Uh, and I, I'm not going to try and pronounce where you live. You can give me the different versions. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I look forward to, to meeting you in real life and uh, taking the conversation further. So uh, thanks once again and keep up the good work. Thank you so much, Ross. It's been great chatting to you. Thanks, Louise. Bye now. Thank you. See you soon. Bye.